I'm probably not the only one who has heard of fake news. I uh, noticed that uh, the last couple of years, more and more people are talking about it, and mostly on social media, and to be even more specific, Twitter. In a, a day and age where fewer people believe in the concept of truth, disinformation thrives and a fact-free politics prevails, liars with financial or ideological agendas profit. In this first panel discussion, moderated by Jago Kasolowski, chief editor of Mo, we will dig deeper into this topic and see how we can turn helplessness into action. Being truthful in the disinformation age, I would like to pass the mic to Jago Kasolowski. Thank you, Zoe. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, thanks for taking the time um, for this session. It is my great honor to introduce a very talented uh, panel. I will start with Nathalie van Randonk. Um, she's a doctorate researcher at the uh, University of Brussels, and she's also connected to the Hannah Arendt uh, Institute in Mechelen. Um, next to her is sitting Kirill Hartog. Uh, he is um, in the Board of Governors of Are We Europe, which is a pan-European foundation um, which supports media initiatives across Europe. And next to him is sitting Eva Davidova. She is the spokesperson for Amnesty International Flanders. She is a journalist and a human rights activist with roots in che Chechnya. So, um, before we start off this session, uh, the topic of today is how to be truthful in the age of disinformation. We have a lot of expertise here in the panel. I would like to ask the people to briefly, because I already gave a short introduction, introduce themselves, their work, what they specialize on, and also one thing they want you to remember for this session. So we'll go down the road. Natalie, you can kick off. Uh, thanks, Yago, and thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to um, be able to speak to an audience again instead of just my computer. Um, so I'm Natalie van Ramlonk. I'm, uh, as Yago said, a researcher at the VUB, the Brussels University. Uh, my research is mainly on um, yeah, the organic spread of disinformation, hate speech, the way that platforms are built in a way that potentially creates certain norms among people um, to allow certain behavior. And so what I think, yeah, we'll, we'll have a very interesting discussion, I hope, but what I would like people to take away from the session is um, to not feel bad if it feels difficult to find your way around the information ecosystem. It is not your fault that it is difficult. Um, there is a lot of information pollution in the online uh, social media ecosystem. Some of it is deliberate, some of it isn't. Uh, and so to not feel like it's it's all your fault but to not be complacent at the same time just because this happens doesn't mean we should let it happen so i think that's kind of what uh, would be the main takeaway i hope from the session carol yeah yeah hi very nice to be here um talking about such an important topic so my name is carol hartog i'm um one of the co-founders of are we europe which started as an independent magazine and then indeed as iago said blossomed into a foundation for uh, storytelling, I would say. Uh, so it's mostly journalism initiatives. We do documentaries in Eastern Europe, at the edges of Europe, uh, really searching for this uh, European identity and bringing uh, creative talent together uh, around our production. So podcasts, um, print magazines, investigations, um, uh, documentaries, all that stuff. Uh, I was the editor-in-chief for about six years, and a couple months ago I, I decided to focus on uh, other projects. But uh, my main takeaway, actually, that I would like to uh, put out there today is I have zero expertise on the technical platform, social media side of things. Um, but in our magazine and, and in our stories, we realize that there's this very essential human uh, aspect to disinformation. So the human impact, like how does this change people's lives? Personal stories, you know, families being torn apart. Um, you know, we all know in the Ukraine-Russia conflict, this is happening. So that's, I guess, what I uh, would like to focus on today. Eva? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Eva Davidova. I'm the spokesperson for Amnesty International here in Flanders. And as Many of you might probably have heard uh, Amnesty International uh, researches and reports about human rights uh, violations around the globe. And today, what I'm hoping to do is connect the impact that this information has on human rights around the globe. And also, um, maybe after you leave the session, to just 
let you feel a little bit more hopeful about the future because I know it can be very overwhelming and, and intimidating all these new things coming up uh, in technology and deep fakes so um, I just want you to feel a little bit more empowered after this panel. Thank you. Okay, and to the audience, we'll have time uh, at the end of the talk for questions as well, so please keep those uh, till the end. That is, if I cut off in time, because I already have 100 questions to ask. I'm, I'm gonna start with Natalie. You talked about the people making money uh, on misinformation, disinformation, the business model behind it, and as Kirill said, effectively, disinformation is in my personal opinion, similar to cults, tearing people apart, tearing families apart, people saying they lose their mother, father, went down the rabbit hole of, of some disinformation theory. I kind of want to want to ask how do we counter the fact that today this is just a business model that a lot of big organizations and a lot of people profit hugely from. Yeah, I think it's, it's maybe um, important to give some historical context first because um, it's definitely true that the social media platforms that we have right now are a very big element in why there's so much disinformation, why people profit from it, um, why it's, it's, it effectively spreads. Um, but it's not a new phenomenon. So disinformation, misinformation, um, disinformation is done deliberately, misinformation isn't. Uh, so it's, it's unfactual information that people spread without really being aware of the fact that it's wrong. Um, and this always kind of has been a thing in the history of humanity. Um, and quite often this peaked when there was a new communication technology. So there's been research done showing that um, when newspapers were introduced, when the radio was introduced, um, it always kind of had a bit of a peak. Uh, and the main reason is because at some point um, people get a platform for uh, opinions and that opinions given more platform becomes almost equal to facts. So it becomes very hard for people to distinguish between the two. What we've never seen before in the history of, of humanity is that people start denying objectively observable facts. The fact that, um, you know, that there were dead people on the streets of Bucha, that this wasn't staged. Um, so this, this is a new phenomenon. And in this whole fact that platforms do give yeah, a, a platform to opinions, um, what we've never seen before is that it gets amplified to the amount that it does right now. Uh, like uh, in the introduction was already said, like Twitter is, is a big problem. Twitter is one of those platforms that um, it's made for amplification. Uh, it's, it's entirely global and it can rapidly spread when given the possibility. And so a lot of these platforms were built for virality. And initially, a lot of people said, oh my God, this is amazing, eh? you can become viral within a day, the, the YouTube stars, uh, the Arab Spring. Um, but even now, there's still a lot of movements that do benefit from the fact that information can go viral. Eh? Black Lives Matter keeps being a very um, important uh, movement that was thanks to social media for a big part um, that people were able to organize and come on the street. But the business model of these platforms has always been um, to keep as many people on the platform to sell advertisement. You are being kept on that platform so you will see more advertisements. And the way that you're kept on there is by you know, playing into your emotions, uh, something that uh, um, you laugh about, that makes you angry, you will stay longer. And by staying longer, you will see more ads. And this is unfortunately the situation that we're in right now. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff calls it that surveillance capitalism. Your data is being used to be sold to um, platforms and, and data brokers who can then use it to show you more advertisement. And it seems so trivial that it's just because of ads, but a lot of the way that, that our democracy is kind of deteriorating and, and that this information is spreading is just so you see more ads. It's in incredibly interesting also because we tend to accept things that we know and that we know for a long time as a given fact, but years ago, for example, I had an interview on this topic with Sant Fish, who was a researcher researching alternatives to social media platforms, and he really opened my mind to the fact that it doesn't need to be a necessity that these networks are built in a way that we see these effects. There are alternatives, there are other options. The only question is, in a capitalist system, which model turns out to be the most effective. I, I want to transfer next to a question for Eva because Natalie very cleverly, basically the old narrative of information is power. We're in a transition period where a new medium 
gets massively popular. It's the wild, wild west. We don't exactly know how to deal with this yet. Um, but this does have an impact on, on people, on countries, on regions. And I want to pass it to Eva for this one. Oh, Iago, I could give you countless examples of how disinformation affects our society, but I will limit myself to three. Um, first, in the past, I would like to go back to um, Operation Desert Storm. Uh, it was early 90s, I'm sure most of you know about it. Um, and I'm referring to this because recently, about a month ago, uh, Pin van der Hoeve published a book uh, called Spoken, so ghosts in English. And there she um, well, she discusses three cases of fake news that led to war in the world, but I have specifically taken Operation Desert Storm as an example because Amnesty International back in the day in the early 90s also um, has allowed itself to be trapped by this because uh, we were also spreading this as facts. But to summarize it for everyone, um, so Operation Desert Storm began after a fabricated murder of premature babies by Iraqi soldiers in Kuwait was reported. And then US uh, spread this as a, to make a case to then go and liberate Kuwait. That was it in summary. Very interesting book uh, that you can all read. A more uh, recent research by Amnesty um, documented how misinformation about the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, closely been linked to violations to the um, right to health. So people were denied access to uh, accurate and trustworthy information that could then in turn allow themselves to take informed decisions about their own health. And um, a third example that I can give to you um, is a very sad and, and recent one. I'm sure, especially people living in Brussels, are connected to VUB, have heard of Iranian Swedish professor Ahmad Reza Jalali. So he um, has been jailed in Iran and um, accused of spying for the West, and there is a death penalty hanging. And now on Wednesday, a uh, press agency in Iran published, ESNA published, that, he, that they have set a date for him and by the for the of, execution, yeah, for the execution. Sorry, and that um, by the 21st of May, latest, that he will get executed. And of course, we're mobilizing everyone uh, on all levels to prevent this from happening. But why it is so difficult to free him is that when he was captured, he was um, denied access to his lawyer for months. They kept him in isolation for months, which amounts to torture. There were also reports of psychological torture. So they threatened that they would kill his family. He has a wife and two kids living in Sweden, where he also worked and lived. Um, so then, they f but with this psychological torture, they uh, forced him on camera to confess um, all these crimes that they were um, holding against him. So now that these tapes exist, the Iranian media also spread this disinformation. Um, it's very hard to then, for his lawyer, prove that this was all forced. And so it can be on a global scale how it in impacts our society, but it can also be very individual cases and families being ruined and human lives um, being, yeah, hopefully not ended, but uh, we try to, to stop this now. Yeah, this brings me to the fact that these fake narratives, these stories that are planted and, and used in global conflicts, but also in, in small scale things, these days it very much seems that in business, politics, media, whatever industry you want to look at, controlling the narrative, um, and the same goes for civil society organizations, controlling the narrative has become the main um, mission and the main purpose. And aside from Desert Storm, there's plenty of other examples. Yeah, with Iraq, there were the weapons of mass destruction that were never found. Um, and Putin has the narrative, he's quite lazy in his storytelling, but he always finds, stumbles upon some genocide on ethnic Russians in another country. And um, of course, Putin being Putin, he wants to save those people, which he does not. Um, so you see this coming back and back again. And I, I wanna ask Kirill because as a journalist, I think we both agree that there is no one object, objective factual truth. There are facts, 
but even how you interpret those facts, how you communicate about those facts, how you, which language you use, is never neutral and objective. So my question to you, Kirill, is how do you fight against disinformation, misinformation, also as a civil society actor, without having to suddenly agree with the idea that there's one single truth and that you hold that truth? Because there's nothing more that will convince people that you're talking against that you're just one of the liars if you hold so. How do you kind of reconcile those two facts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is like the textbook question you get at university when you study journalism, right? Like, does objectivity exist? And um, I think it's actually something that, that Natalie said that made me think. Um, it, it's not so much the fact that there is one objective truth. It's the fact that we live in an era where things that can be proven to be true are no longer believed because we're in this post-truth era. And that's the thing that concerns me the most. And then, so that's also where I would look for the solution in a way. You know, it's... Um, there's, yeah, it's, it's a huge question. I mean, we can talk about the broken business model of journalism, you know, huge problem. I've seen it in our newsroom. I've seen many, many other organizations struggle with it. And I'm talking especially uh, small and medium, you know, not the, not the big guys, not the economist or the guardian, because they have the resources to do their work. But um, people that are like organizations that are smaller, um, being forced to produce clickbaity articles, you know, because that's the business model. Journalists focusing on marketing and social media instead of reporting, which is what they should be doing. You know, so much time and effort and money is going into that direction, whereas it should actually be going to producing quality journalism, right? So um, I, I would want to put it out there that we need to fix the business model of journalism first, and we need to see it as what it is, which is good information is the cornerstone of a functioning democracy. And if uh, governments and citizens are not willing to invest in it, right, so either we have the BBC model where it's taxpayers, you know, funding it, or we have, we go back to a model where people get used to paying for what they consume, because that's the weird thing about the internet. Everything is free, but it's not, because your data is being sold, right? And it's the same with journalism. Like, it's, you know, our magazine, we've been around for five years now, um, it's, it's just incredible to see how difficult it is to convince someone to, to subscribe to, to you know, a print product these days. And I mean, I get it, you know, it's niche, it's independent magazines, but even, the, you know, The Guardian and, and BBC and everyone I've spoken to there is also struggling with this question. So, I don't know, I, I would say that we have to fix the business model, we have to give journalists space to do their job instead of focusing on clicks and ads and growth marketing, you know, and that would be a really good first step. <laughs> Definitely, uh, I can only agree with that. Next year, Mo will be in existence for 20 years. And I mean, we've been around for quite a bit longer, but even for us, the, these risks, how to survive in this environment, in this, this information space is incredibly difficult. And especially when you also see the fact that policymakers who want to invest in journalism, they tend to disagree with the fact that the best thing to stop disinformation is investing in good journalism because the only means that are very easy for me to find or if I want to start a new startup or build a new app, an app isn't going to save us because if it would, one of the millions that are there would have already done so. So I think this is something you're referring to, which I recognize as well. It's very hard to find means to fund journalism. It's much easier to find means um, to, to support all the stuff that goes around it, marketing, all of, all of these things. And with, at risk of becoming too philosophical, but, but I want to talk about the value of information and how effectively in a few decades we went from a situation where information was valuable and the power dynamic was with civil society organizations who had this information, was with media organizations who had this information, into the current age was where we see an infodemic and information essentially has become free but also immensely um, polluted. Um, I want to ask a question um, to, to you, Natalie. In the grand scheme of things, do you agree with, with that analysis that this is very much about it, a much deeper issue than specifically social media. This is about, I, I recently read in, in medieval times, a book would be worth as much as a house. You know, it, it's a bit extreme to go back hundreds of years, but if you come to now, I wonder how you look at that shift. Yeah, I mean, the, the information overload makes it really difficult to, um, you know, put a value on, on whatever information is, is more 
trustworthy, uh, you know, the one that's most accessible might be the one that um, people will be most inclined to believe or to read. But I think we, we need to take a step back and really ask, like, uh, what makes people value information? Um, and before, you know, in the BBC model type of uh, uh, journalistic times, it's really people would value it because it comes from a journalistic institution. Um, and I think we're moving a bit away from trust in institutions. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we've struggled for the longest time uh, with social justice movements um, to battle against institutions and to just blindly believe in institutions. Um, I think the problem has become that in moving away from trust in institutions, people have started to move towards only trust in specific people. Like this person uh, uh, is the one that speaks the most to me, so I'm gonna believe them. Uh, and that's kind of the wrong direction we're moving into. What we should be moving into is um, trust in processes. So what makes information valuable is that it's gone through a journalistic process, that has gone through a scientific process, that people can verify like, oh, this has been scrutinized. The person who has come up with this information has put in the effort to verify that it's factual. So the question shouldn't be, has information become less valuable? It's more like what value have people started attaching to this? Um, do they just connect it to a person? Um, and I think it's important also, this is quite deliberate. Uh, um, Hannah Arendt also speaks of the fact that, you know, disinformation and then disinformation pollution, it's not to convince people of a certain narrative, but it's to make people so confused and, and make it so hard to know what to believe anymore that they just start believing people and charismatic leaders. And that's the big problem of, of misinformation. Incredibly interesting. It was Steve Bannon, I think, who, who summarized this in, in the most uh, quotable way when he said, just drown them in shit. Yeah. Flood the, the, the zone the, with shit. Yeah, yeah. The, the, eff, the effective meaning of disinformation campaigns of spreading rumors is never to convince people, but it's to devaluate all the other information, setting up a fake news website that looks like a small reporting outfit that you or I could be running the part of that isn't that people go and visit that website, it's the fact that people don't see the difference. So then we come back to the question of trust, you know, how do we regain the trust of readers, of people, and this is something that also goes for people in civil society organizations. And I think there, I wanna ask the question to you, Eva. I come from the countryside in Flanders, not trusting a politician, not trusting uh, a journalist, that's the same thing. And I think it's very hard for people in these, I mean, we are an, an elite grouping, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think it's very hard to understand that we don't have that trust either. So I can write an article saying, look, uh, this politician abroad is doing, a, for example, we published a story on Cameroon, the dictator there setting up fake news websites, um, working with re Republican spin doctors in the US, paying them to do this, so that if you look for Paul Bia and uh, some of his stories in English, you will find some great stories about Cameroon, which you should never believe. Um, so th the fact that, that this is happening, that's, that's the whole point. That's that the business model and the idea behind it, and it is, it is successful. And I wanna ask to you, Eva, how do we convince the public that we have lost as civil society organizations, as media, how do we regain their trust? Because in all fairness, a lot of media, a lot of journalists haven't really earned it the last decades. So I wanna ask that to you, Eva. Um, first of all, to answer the, the first question of what is the value of information? How, how do you value that? At Amnesty, we always say human rights change starts with the facts. So that's why we're so rigorous in our research and since the um, Desert Storm operation, we have a very strict policy on, on our research and fact-checking. I can assure you that will not happen again. Um, but then to answer your um, question about the, the broader audience and how to gain their trust again, um, I think when it comes to this information, we have to take into account that we have dif different actors. So yes, we, there's us uh, as the public, there's the different companies like Twitter and, and the responsibility they carry and the lack of transparency as well. But then there's also the government. And at Amnesty, when we do our research and we put out uh, our findings, we also always attach um, recommendations to it. And a lot of the times, those are then towards the government because it is, uh, 
human right, you know, the right to education. So it is up to the politicians uh, or, or government to make sure that the people are um, resilient, that they know how to recognize um, a deep fake video, for example. So it's really from up there that the policy, everything should be shaped to make sure that we are, as citizens, are resilient when it comes to this information. That's the first step. Very interesting, because that's empowering for the audience and giving them the, the tools to, to use this. And we're getting more into the hopeful space now, which is something very good, because I tend to be cynical around these topics myself, personally. I, w I want to ask a question to you, Kirill. We see a lot of investment uh, these days, especially in the um, English language space in media. Uh, in fact-checking, and fact-checking is a new hot thing. Facebook is, is funding it partially, obviously, to, to clean up its image, um, but there's a lot of governments funding these kind of projects. I wonder, uh, as a journalist, is fact-checking the, the solution to, to misinformation, or is it kind of, you know, as they say in, in Flemish, uh, mopping while the, the tap is running? Yeah. Um, it's, I, I don't feel comfortable proclaiming an, an opinion on whether fact-checking is useful, but I do know that in many cases it's very easy nowadays to get funding for fact-checking stuff, and it's not as easy to get funding for other sorts of things. And um, I would actually put a question out there, in, you know, even in the audience, like how many people, <laughs> well-informed readers who care about disinformation, have you know, gone on a fact-checking website, you know, have you actually read these investigations? It's incredibly dry. You know, it's the same thing about WikiLeaks and the Panama Papers, and all those things. It's really good that they exist, but it's a, it's a niche of people that actually care, policymakers, you know, academics. It has little public appeal. Yeah, and so I would say actually what we need more is uh, compelling storytelling, but that is well done, and that is research, because the reporting that we've done on disinformation, every time uh, what we what we see, and so this is taking it away from the policy level, making it very very simple and down to earth. What we see is that it's about identity and about belonging. There's a, there's a psychological element to disinformation that I feel is 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 ignored very often in the debate, which is you know uh, we have stories of a lady, you know, this daughter writing about her mother who then, you know, believes in all kinds of, you know, cults and, uh, you know, magical stones and, and all of this stuff. And it starts as a community on Facebook and then it start and it goes into, you know, Zoom conversations and then it's the YouTube algorithm. And as you say, in the end, you go down the rabbit hole and you lose touch with reality. So one way to counter that would be to, um, you know, to have those conversations to frame, you know, stories about disinformation in a human and in an accessible and an understandable way, you know, get rid of the, the jargon if it's not necessary. Um, and there's some really cool initiatives, like we're working with a, um, a company called Tilt, and they have a game that's called Radicalize, where basically it's, 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 it's um, vaccination or inoculation theory, I think they, they call it, so basically you, you play the evil guy basically so they tell you you take over twitter you spread rumors etc and it's a game it's very interactive and by understanding how manipulation techniques work you're better uh you can defend yourself better when when you're being targeted and they're doing this in high schools they're doing this with policy makers and uh the university of cambridge um recently found that you know it, it, it improves resilience to disinformation by 30 percent so i think there's also these gamified you know there's these new ways of um, especially children, you know, because we need to focus on media literacy for generations that are e extremely social, social media savvy, you know, um, and that don't watch TV at all, that don't, you know, read any of the traditional news outlets. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. No, Natalia, I want to go to you. Media literacy, is this the solution? Yeah, well, I, I fully agree with the, the fact, like, fact-checking isn't um, going to be the end all uh, solution. Um, and inoculation is a very promising avenue that we're going on. Um, we need all of it at the same time, I think. And that's, that's what bothers me sometimes in the whole, like, does fact checking work? It's like, no, of course it doesn't. Uh, humans aren't that simple, where it's just like, I believe in thing A, thing A is wrong. Okay, I stop believing in thing A. It, it, that's not how it works, of course. Um, but fact checking has a lot of value in the fact that, um, when people are convinced of a certain narrative, 
and they don't find uh, specific information that counters that narrative. Uh, and when the people surrounding them can't actually have a conversation with them about them about it because they don't even know themselves like what is right or what is wrong, um, it really helps to be able to just search. Like I, I do this all the time. I see something, post something, and I just Google like uh, fact check uh, a specific thing. Um, and it's not about them being able to say like, haha, you were wrong. But it's about being able to engage in a conversation and say, hey, you know, as a social community, um, I really care about this topic as well. But have you seen that it's actually not right and that we should maybe scrutinize this a little bit? I think it's very important that these tools are available because I see a fact check as a tool in the same sense that media literacy is, is a tool making people know how to recognize if something isn't very reliable. And a fact check is just a tool that we use within communities, within society, um, to be able to hold ourselves to better standards, to be able to, um, you know, if your uncle in a WhatsApp group posts a piece of, of uh, you know, COVID misinformation, that you can tell him in private, like, hey, uncle, um, I don't know if you know, but that, that isn't really correct, like I saw this here. You can do this in an empathic way that we kind of help each other out in this. Can I just, um, yeah, I'm out yeah. of curiosity, but isn't there this um, double double down effect? You know, that when you present it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's been also, the problem with this is that it's really hard to say what works, what doesn't work, because humans are super complex people. And about the backfire effect, 10 years ago they said, oh my god, yes, if you, if you um, correct people, they'll, they'll double down. Researchers are coming back from that. They've seen that there's so many mitigating factors in this. If you do it in private, if you do it empathically, uh, if you, you know that person well, these are all mitigating factors that will make people not double down or that maybe in the longer run you've planted a seed so that somebody will, you know, scrutinize the next thing more. So it's, it's very, very difficult at the stage of, of society that we're right now to really say this works, does, this doesn't work. That's the downside of having a, a great journalist in your panel. He asked the question I was about to ask. So, no, 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 sorry. I just want to continue on that. It was great to see. The, the fact, effectively, is sometimes do you push away certain people that you're trying to, and again, and I'm so happy that all three of you have said this, we come back to human nature and the fact that a lot of these things, it's not accidental that in the midst of a pandemic, uh, misinformation, disinformation is rampant. Uh, it is not that weird that after 9-11, for example, in 2001, a lot of conspiracy theories came up when humans are looking for patterns to understand the world around them. And when the world is chaotic, gray, incredibly complicated as it is today and it has, as it has been before and as it will be again, uh, these theories are, are more successful. And it was very interesting to hear the, the things that you said, uh, Natalie, about you know, doing these conversations in private, trying to be constructive, uh, em empathetic. Um, but if in the end it all comes down to human nature, and this is a question I want to pose to all three of you, um, what are the odds in the long run um, of truth prevailing? What are the odds in the long run of organizations who try to present some honest version or transparent version of the truth? What are the odds if it is human nature to find appeal in theories that don't necessarily do this? And Whoever is brave enough to answer this one first, I'll, uh, I'll let them kick it off. I'll maybe start, because I can't give you a percentage of the odds, uh, but I can tell you that at Amnesty, as, as the press officer at Amnesty, what I do daily is um, just make sure that the information we have collected, the facts that we have, that this gets out uh, and that it reaches our people. We have 10 million supporters all over the world that they are informed and in countries, for example, right now in Russia where Amnesty, uh, the Moscow office was actually our regional office based in Moscow, um, had to be closed uh, a while ago. Um, and we are completely blocked, our website is blocked, we can't get to the people, so then we look for ways around that. For example, Telegram in Russia is a very <clears throat> nice way to still reach the people with the correct information and the facts. And the way that we, I mean, to let truth prevail, I don't know, the way we try to fight this information is by sharing our own information. That's, that's all we can do at this point, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think 
it's not about will truth prevail, but will we remain in the same reality? Will we be able to move forward together? Um, will we be able to base ourselves on, on the same facts to you know, diverge in opinions and perspectives on where we go? So I think we're going through a bit of a growing pains as a society, as, as I said in the beginning, we, we, we have this whole historic uh, context to show that like, it is a process that we need to kind of go through. Um, we might not get better, I don't, but we're hopeful today. So um, I, I do think we will get through it in the sense that we, we need to collaborate. We need, we have huge climate change problems at our doorstep. And if there's still people denying that there is a problem or if there's people denying that uh, XYZ solutions are the better solutions, um, we won't be able to move forward. So I do think at some point there will be a sort of necessity of, of you know, the, the whole deep democracy discussions that we're seeing now. I think it's a very interesting evolution of um, trying to get on just the same level of reality. And it's not about will the truth prevail, but will we get on the same reality to move forward? Um, and I do have hopes for that. Um, which might prove to be too optimistic in the future, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I, I think I'll go back to my uh, traditional, uh, you know, safe, safe journalism thing. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm half Russian myself. I have Russian friends. My sister is a, is a, is a, was a journalist in Moscow up until a month ago, and she had to to get out, obviously. And um, I think it's just interesting to see that. Uh, we have so many liberties and freedoms and the rule of law in, in where we live, where all of us live, that are being taken for granted. And I think that I would just want to, you know, keep put that out there, that let's not wait until, you know, we slide into authoritarianism in order to pr uh, protect the truth. Because if you say, if you, do we want the truth to prevail? Like, first of all, you need a functioning information ecosystem. And all the problems with social media, which I uh, fully recognize, they still do not compare to a 15-year prison sentence in Russia for mentioning the word uh, war, right? So um, th that would be my answer. And uh, we did a crowdfunding for Ukrainian independent media. It went incredibly well. We raised 4 million euros, which we did not expect. But it just goes to show that we need... Like basically, the the day people wake up is when bombs start falling on Ukraine, and it's like, oh, now we need to support Ukrainian independent media. It's like, yeah, but Putin has been um, doing hybrid information warfare for the past 10 years there, 15 years, um, and now it's a little bit too late. You know, these guys are buying bulletproof vests to do their job instead of you know preventing it 10 years ago. So that would be my uh, uh, thing, and then I would say uh, I was recently optimistic because I took a blah blah car with um, a, a French couple who uh, were planning on voting uh, Le Pen. And, and, and I had six hours to spend with them. <laughs> and my phone, uh, my roaming wasn't working for some reason. So